So, um, so I just want to say a few words about the videos we're going to watch, both the video and then this uh, bit of a reportage. Um, we've heard from Bjorn about how to think in various ways about formality and informality and that this can be um, a false binary, it can be limiting, it can be reductive, it can do violence to particular ways uh, that cities are constituted. Um, but at the same time, there are definitions and recognition of, of these terms, um, the formal and informal. And, uh, and there are quite useful techniques for mapping informality um, in urban settlements. Um, and part of our ambition with this course is also to, to think of ways in which we can employ various methods to good use in uh, understanding urban transformation. So the first video, or rather the video that we'll watch now, it's um, looking at, uh, at a technique of this sort. Let me just share the screen. Here you see Richard uh, Slusas um, as part of a, a UN Habitat video series uh, that, that you are welcome to look at. There are also other lectures um, and exercises there. But he's uh, going to talk us through different ways of mapping informal settlements or slums. So let's watch that first. And then after that, we'll have about five minutes uh, if you want to scroll through this second story, which is from Al Jazeera called Drowning Megacities on the Front Lines of the African Climate Battle. So I'm not going to take you through this on my screen, um, just giving you a glimpse here. But uh, after we've watched the video, you can spend another five minutes just looking through kind of the, the headlines on this story. There's also some videos on there. You might uh, want to watch them later. Some of you might have seen them already, but um, let's, let's do both those things and then get into the discussion. So here's, uh, here's Richard, it's Lisa's. So that was, uh, that was the video. And now if you click the link in the chat, you should be able to get onto this page with the Al Jazeera story on drowning megacities. Let's, uh, let's give it five minutes. So we start uh, with group, group four kicking off the discussion at uh, 11.20, kicks off. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh... And the way we manage this is we um, allocated uh, each member of the group to one of the questions. So I'm, I'll be looking into the uh, first question, which looks into uh, discussing the importance of participatory approaches in cartography and rendering previously invisible settlements legible to planners. So um, basically, we, ha we had sort of two points uh, to discuss within this uh, question. So. Uh, first of all, we do agree that participatory approaches are quite, use, are quite useful to, to empower planners to sort of understand uh, spaces from the perspectives of the individuals living there in some sense. Uh, so in, 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 in other words, they sort of try to extract the local knowledge as spatial constructions uh, and try to make use of these knowledge uh, for moving forward in, in order to identify different uh, planning uh, policies in some sense. And the way we view it is that this is potentially important to uh, unfold some spatial injustices that may be present in uh, in the settlements that they are actually looking into. So it can empower planners to um, identify how to look into, for example, instances where specific spatial um, uh, citizens are ex um, ex are um, exposed to extreme climate conditions, for instance, or uh, some kind of unequal distribution of spatial amenities. So it does empower planners in that sense. Uh, but we sort of had a criticism on uh, the, the overall approach to, to, to mapping um, in, uh, in, 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 in this presentation. So it strictly aims to construct space in, in its objective dimension in some sense. So it tries to look into maps and try to attach meanings to these maps. But actually mapping can uh, extend beyond that in order to uh, give the floor to participants in some sense to um, map their own perception of space subjectively. So in some sense, uh, some approaches actually allow participants to uh, map on 
white sheets of paper or basically just to allocate how they perceive space and they perceive their settlements in terms of uh, where they live and the different um, landmarks they perceive. And this actually gives opportunities to identify how these individuals living in those settlements um, perceive this continuum between the formal and informal and the visible and invisible settlements. Uh, because this is uh, mostly entangled in the reality of their everyday lives where they have to navigate between these, what we define as informal and what we define as formal. And these methods tend to unpack these uh, realities in some sense. So yeah, this is where we stop. Yeah, and I would like to point out to maybe one of the readings that have been inspiring for me that looks into this urban informality and this duality of Ananya Roy, where she looked into urban informality and she looked into an epistemology of planning where she argued that this, this is a continuum, and a continuum of space and it should be looked into as a continuum rather than a divisive uh, thing. Yeah. So I can give floor to maybe the second question. Uh, yes. Um, in the second question, we are to discuss uh, the met methodological challenges of mapping uh, rapidly changing areas and distinguishing uh, between temporary and permanent settlements. Um, so as the urban features are quite fragmented and as there is no straightforward way to categorize informal and formal settlements. Um, it's difficult because uh, sometimes slums are intertwined with existing and formal buildings or areas like around all historic arch architecture, for instance, or high rising apartment complexes. Um, and also this movement and uh, is quite fast tracked with the building of slums and there is an unpredicted movement of people and households. So to separate between the temporary and the permanent is, well, can be difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, and these areas are constructed by their inhabitants. So to divide between the formal and informal, can be a bit vague and therefore when one can ask uh, the, the inhabitants of these slum areas themselves um, how they perceive the areas they are living in so you could have a participatory mapping uh, for instance uh, to discover how the informal inhabitants actually perceive their space uh, and uh, if their space is formal or informal or temporary or permanent. And so in that way, one can um, have the view of the inhabitants themselves and not only from someone external. Yeah. Maria, yeah. a quick, uh, a quick uh, question that you, um, reflect on whether some of these ways, some of these methods that would allow distinctions or sort of deeper insights are quite effort intensive. And so if we think of, of a larger body of literature, mm -hmm. I, there might be a tendency that we see much less of certain kinds of accounts than of others, um, just in terms of the volume of, uh, volume of work out there. Is that uh, what does that do to to the idea of being able to really map these distinctions, given how rapid change is, and if it takes a lot of effort, is there a risk that the kind of work we really need is perhaps left left out or in the minority of academic production? Um, I don't know. Can you? I'm not sure if I really understood your question. Uh, if it is too complex, uh, you know, uh, to in this part uh, participatory mapping is if it is kind of too complex to undertake, or uh, I guess it would be very time consuming. 
Mm. And so if change yeah. is happening quite rapidly, mm. is it possible to keep pace with it? There's a number of traditions like rapid participatory appraisal, the set of methods also that tries to kind of compress the data collection, if you like, into something that can be done quite quickly. And then there's a the whole critique around um, whether that that is too reductive, whether we lose some of the richness. But I guess I'm interested in how you think about the trade-off between doing really in-depth work over a long time versus the kind of urgency of the need. If we look at something like the drowning megacities, there's a ticking, ticking, a clock that's ticking down. So there's also a challenge to do research that's on the same kind of time scale as the urgency of some of these problems. Yes, I see that. Um, but I guess it's difficult for me to say anything more about that, but I see that it, uh, it's difficult maybe to keep, keep up with the, the challenges in such a, a research. Uh, a participatory mapping that that could be a challenge yes maybe i can jump in and help um i'm from the same group um i think in general participatory and kind of co-production processes have the the downside of being very slow and time consuming and so while they're very important with the urgency of of what we need to do there's yeah there's definitely definitely a kind of uh, um, yeah. There's also sometimes a need for rapid process, which which these things don't necessarily allow. May I? Um, I thought there was a weird uh, divide just in in the presentation um, or in the video between, on the one hand, uh, the the slow and time effect or time consuming participatory methods, on on the other hand, the digital methods which uh, were presented as if they do not allow for uh, participation. And I think um, actually these di digital methods could also be co-developed with uh, dwellers and uh, you know, citizens from, from these situations. And I think that is a, a very common critique on, on um, yeah, digital tools and methods that they hold uh, certain rationalities within them, um, which I think, which is often termed as um, algorithmic bias or something. Yeah, um, that is that that they only allow for certain methods of analyzing and categoriz categorizing, and I think uh, this would also be a, a pretty good chance in uh, evolve uh, or uh, integrating. And citizens from the respective situations, and that could maybe um, make a much more effective situations like this to do uh, participatory approaches. Can I can I add an example to to what Lucas has said? Um, the actually the the online maps. Um, have been used here or are being used here uh, as an interactive way of mapping uh, some areas. This has been uh, uh, particularly uh, helpful in, in some of the uh, agricultural areas in Egypt where uh, knowing the boundaries of the land and whose property is it has been a, a little bit hard uh, to, uh, to pinpoint exactly. Uh, so they have been used and they are accurate most of the time, uh, the, the question of accuracy always come to place, but um, uh, as they uh, require several people to uh, say the same thing for it to, to show them that this place belongs to, to this person, uh, it is quite accurate in, in this sense and it helps uh, in, in making uh, the mapping process really faster than going on foot to do it and much more uh, efficient economically as well. If I may add uh, something, if we are only focusing on the participatory approaches uh, related to technology, uh, we tend to overlook that uh, the, the 
there is that's not the only way to engage people through technology. Um, I've been part of uh, some um, other workshops in which uh, participatory approach uh, has been a huge success because you can engage uh, common people, common citizens who are the ones, who are the stakeholders, who are basically the ones who carry the knowledge. Although they are not researchers, they are the ones who, help, who hold the knowledge, who could provide the most insightful information from the area. So you can recruit a lot of people at the same time and provide just a piece of the whole plan of the whole place of the whole area and each one could provide a useful feedback for uh, the purpose for the researchers to do the main uh, work. Um, some other examples uh, you might have heard of, for example, um, the projects in which uh, many thousands of computers all around the world are uh, connected uh, somehow during the uh, night, during the early hours of um, while everybody is sleeping, trying to map some part of the constellations in which scientists and researchers do not hold the complete resources, not only technological, but the, the, the time to do that. They, they need a lot of resources, so they uh, get together with just the assistance of a common citizen just to provide their own uh, hardware. And uh, they analyze uh, a piece of information. Then the researchers just get together all that and um, provide a, a, an analysis. So the same system has uh, proved um, successful in uh, some other areas. And uh, um, I consider this could work, especially with the slums. That, uh, if you put a researcher in the middle of an area they, are not, they have no knowledge about, it could be difficult. However, if you engage the people living there, it is easier to collect that and information and it is faster than any other way. Yeah, that would be my opinion. Should we move into question three? So that's discussed the term climate apartheid, so which is so quite different from the first two questions in some sense. Um, so we've defined climate apartheid as pervasive inequalities in the distribution of climate impacts through systemic, spatial, economic and institutional exclusion. And I think the, uh, as per the Al Jazeera article, the eco-Atlantic city is one kind of new explicit example of this, um, where people are excluded and there's a kind of inside outside where some people become more potentially more climate resilient within that, um, the eco city, while the people outside, it seems, are, um, whose vulnerability is actually increasing as a result of this of this uh, new city from which they're excluded. Um, I think in the context that I'm familiar with in South Africa, the South African townships in which you have, if you use that distinction, both formal and informal settlements, um, tend to have a much higher climate vulnerability uh, because of uh, exclusion from opportunity, proper housing, uh, because of the locations in which uh, the housing is based. Um, and there, and there, there's kind of more um, economic barriers to, ent to, 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 to moving into a space of, of higher resilience. And I think just based on the discussion today, I was, I was trying to think about whether the climate apartheid that we see today, the extent to which it is rooted in neoliberalism, so like the lecturer earlier said, the, the collective boogeyman, or whether neoliberalism 
is purely a mechanism to maintain it. Um, and I think maybe to be a little bit um, provocative, um, in some ways I could think about the global north versus the global south as a kind of climate apartheid um, in which we all play a role and the system is so complex that even though we don't want to play a role, we are implicitly part of it, um, of a, a system that excludes some people and, and renders them more vulnerable to, to climate change. I don't know if that made any sense. But... Should I go on to question number four? I think let's see if there's others who have uh, responses to Katinka's point just now. Yeah, if I just um, can can reflect on what Katinka said, I think it's it's um, it's really useful to distinguish between the sort of global climate apartheid between the north and the south, because obviously, <laughs> you know, we are the one. Who have caused the problems? So to to sim to simplify, but still, I mean, uh, we in the north are the ones who are producing and consuming way more than the than the planet can 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 carry. But at the same time, we will probably not be the ones who will suffer the consequences. And at the same time, we can think of it this in the in the urban scale. So there are also the apartheid within within cities and i think it's not 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 only um a problem in africa but i also i mean for example in uh, in in the middle east in 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 cities like dubai and abu dhabi i'll, I'll i think we can see really similar processes of, of these really really rich luxury districts that are trying to build Built to safeguard themselves from climate change, and at the same time, uh, they're uh, enforcing or, or uh, and even even paying or, or offering ways for other people to sort of I don't know move away, so uh, or, or or just leaving them uh, to 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 suffer the consequences. So I think it's a uh, we can understand it, yeah, on a global scale, on an urban scale, but 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 anyway, this um. A big issue. I'm really glad you brought up the point of scale, Silva, because um, um, one way that I find quite useful to approach um, the question of apartheid, that's an extreme one, but um, also inequity in a more uh, banal kind of everyday form is to see if there's these uh, socio-spatial patterns that aren't you know only at the large scale of countries or regions but within the sort of interstitial spaces of uh, of the urban um the urban and the regional as we heard yesterday and 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 then um t taking that one step on whether these patterns repeat across space so do we see similar kinds of patterning in different cities do we see range like ranges of these patterns that apply to certain cities and not to others um, and this is something we'll get into also next week uh, with Jens Kant uh, talking about morphology, the urban form. Um, so there are patterns, but there might also be important distinctions in the kinds of patterns. And part of it, uh, as I read Katinka's point, is you know linked closely with economic systems, um, systematic exclusions, and the eco Atlantic cities, an extreme form of it. But certainly there are more mundane forms if you like and and a lot of uh, interesting work in urban studies to me comes comes from engaging with those kinds of uh, distinctions that are really easy to gloss over unless one digs deeper with the kinds of methods that we've been discussing in in this module um, and this idea of, sorry sorry uh, go ahead I just, it's really quick. Um, the, yeah, talking about this idea of climate apartheid for me boils down to 
vulnerability for some versus resilience for others. Um, and I grew up in Dubai, so I understand Silver's point that he made about how some people can just build their way out of this climate, um, like the climate change, basically, but other people are left to deal with the impacts of that. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's how I interpret it anyway. It's like a vulnerability versus resilience and who goes into what category, but also I guess, like Silla was saying, it can be applied at different scales as well. And um, so even like within the same area, you get some people who are more vulnerable than others at the trade-off of resilience, I think. I just want to sort of put it in international and uh, in historical context. That was from the climate um, apartheid in cities. I was reminded of uh, industrializing cities in, in the global north and how um, the factories were built in the city center and then the, the owning, uh, uh, the capital owners moved further away from the city center up in the hills to sort of escape the smog from the factories that they were building. And, and the taxes. Kind of and, yeah, <laughs> and taxes. Um, and yeah, the, the factories that they were owning, building and profiting from, but escaping from the, from, from the negative effects. So yeah, so these kind of power dynamics are, are quite familiar in, in, in cities. before moving on to the last question to link this into some of the main themes on this course um, we live at a moment when the UK for instance just went two months without burning any coal in its energy system that's the first time in 200 years that we've had 60 days in that country where you could say the industrial revolution started so there is reorganization happening quite rapidly and what form it takes is uh, is an interesting question to get into but also a timely one Okay, so I guess uh, we move forward to the last question of today, um, which is, uh, can a city with built-in social injustice be sustainable? Uh, we started in a group or um, discussion, internal discussion with uh, which it all depends on what this uh, attribution is given to sustainability. Because uh, it's uh, normally the, um, the social aspect of um, sustainability is normally overlooked. We tend to uh, relate sustainability as a environmental aspect. However, um, we, we have to consider that um, the impacts are received uh, on the social sphere of, of the society. That means social injustice or social justice uh, has to be considered in, in, in this equation. So um, inclusion, uh, the, the claims for to include people into and the marginalized urban processes uh, has to be taken into account because if we don't support the capacity of our current or future generations to develop uh, we cannot create healthy and livable communities. Um, so if we consider the five factors that um, um, Indian Nobel Prize uh, laureate um, uh, Amarty, uh, Amartya Sen um, stated, um, the members of uh, socially sustainable communities should be equal, diverse, connected, democratic, and provide a good quality of life. So to summarize, um, in considering these aspects, a society with social injustice cannot be sustainable. Um, if, if I may, um, you mentioned that uh, to create healthy and livable, um, uh, what was the word you used, communities or, uh, yes, so I guess that's what enclavization and these, and these private communities calls into question. If you are wealthy enough to create your, your own utopia and build walls around it, which if, since you brought up North and South, um, essentially Europe is also a fortress, so on all scales, if you can pull that off, uh, and there are still lots of places where people aren't healthy, aren't in livable conditions, but is it, 
is it impossible to think that they can achieve this that you don't need social sustainability to pull off your own private utopia? Uh, right, of course, here what matters is uh, how just is this distribution of wellness? I mean, uh, you can uh, speak about a livable community for few, or but in this sense we're talking about all single members of the community get the benefits in that case as we have analyzed through the sessions today um, mozambique has shown there are areas in which rich people have a good livable life whereas most of the uh, community whom um, a big percentage of the community are not benefit, do not have this benefit from the, the, this good, healthy, livable life. So when we speak about the concept of a community being uh, social, evil, just, we could, as you mentioned, um, utopian would be that every single member of the community could have the benefits of a good life and not only a life but just a comfortable to enjoy from the same benefits which unfortunately uh, uh, well i'm not aware of a, a single community that is benefited that every single member of it can, can get an opportunity of enjoy the same benefits rich and poor it's uh, our society constraints if i can weigh, weigh in on this point i have an opinion um, it is about thinking if the community itself can 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 just be uh, analyzed as a single uh, separate entity from the group so uh, I think that the, the current COVID-19 situation is um, um, a screaming example about the effect that other places and other communities are having even on the fortress communities. So um, um, Europe, Europe, as Devon has mentioned, is a fortress in itself, but it was not immune to uh, an, an, a, a pandemic like this one. Um, also the same situation, um, happens here uh, and we have different social levels and different um, social standards and some people have built their own utopian places to live in but that but when the pandemic has hit and has hit hard they they are as affected as everyone else with the lack of uh, healthcare uh, coverage for for everybody so uh, yes they can momentarily uh, uh, do uh, a, a thing, their thing, but then again, on the larger scale of effect, no, they will get affected by having inequality or social injustice on on a longer term. This is my opinion of the situation. I'm 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 not sure whether I agree. It was an interesting point, but if you look at the COVID situation, for example, in the US, you can see that. The billionaire's fortune and their net worth has 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 skyrocketed uh, throughout the pandemic. So they have actually got richer. So uh, I mean, this uh, we, 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 I'm not sure how this situation will play out uh, in in the coming months and and years. But it seems that that they they were not as affected as the others. And uh, on the on the contrary, they were. Uh, you know, they, they gained even more from it, so. Um, if I may, um, it's more of an abstract thought that I had when listening to all these comments. So I think it opens up to me the, the concern of what justice actually is and how it is interpreted in different contexts to begin with. Uh, so social injustice, in a sense, is can be viewed abstractly from the perspective of a billionaire, for instance, and from the perspective of a, of a poor citizen quite differently, which is actually what inherently may lead to what we call as social injustices and inequalities that we view. Um, 
And there has been a lot of theoretical discussions about this justice. So um, some approached it from a very objective perspective where they tried to constitute an objective justice based on the democratic society's view in some sense, where uh, others looked into it as some form of contextual based justice that is interpreted differently in each context and can be compared in some sense uh, between the different contexts. So it, it's quite an interesting discussion. In, or it's quite an interesting thought for me to sort of share, at least. Right. If, uh, if nobody has a burning uh, question or response there, I think that's very um, germane, very fertile place to leave this discussion. Just a reminder that, uh, sorry, Katinka, did you have something? I have something that's a little bit peripheral, but I wanted to, to mention. I'm, and just ask everyone else whether, I actually really struggled with the video um, that we had and, and the way in which the, the, the person presenting, um, talking about slum mapping, the way in which he talked about slums and categorizing slums and the, the slum dweller, um, I found that quite problematic. So I was wondering if anyone else had that same feeling or whether yeah, I'm being over, over sensitive. Yeah, I can chime in actually. So uh, at least from my experience in my research, because I'm looking into uh, formal and informal settlements in Egypt, uh, I can actually uh, sort of certify that within the case studies that I've looked into and some online questionnaires that I did because of the COVID situation that uh, actually constituting uh, the div division between slum and dwellers and non-slum dwellers have uh, some social implications in the context in some sense. So people are actually sort of provoked when, when you do address them as informal dwellers or slum dwellers. And it actually can, uh, in some cases in my questionnaires, lead to changes in uh, the answers based on how the questions are actually framed and whether the term informal settlements is actually used or in Egypt, we use the term social settlements in some cases in order to point out to the same situation. So this is where this, uh, from an academic perspective, this continuum uh, debate is, is really important to look into. So we do try to categorize things as academics where formal and informal device actually occurs. But uh, in reality, uh, these are very much intertwined and some, in some senses not, not even uh, relevant for the citizens to make this kind of division between where they live and where others live because they they virtually navigate the informal dwellers virtually navigate the formal um, infrastructure for instance and even informal even formal dwellers um, in in some sense do navigate through uh, infrastructure that crosses through in Egypt for instance uh, the informal settlement spatially so it's this device in, in my sense is not really uh, not really helpful in, 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 in addressing the inherent issues within, within these uh, uh, extremely provocative uh, environments in some sense. That's my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point and observation. And uh, there's of course a lot of stigma attached to being, to living in a, in a slum. So in this idea of the slum dweller as that's kind of the identity of the person is, is problematic. I, I used to work in Bolivia and I had a, a family that I stayed with in El Alto, which is a poor, I wouldn't necessarily call it a slum, but it's a definitely a poor area. And when I talked to other people I knew in Bolivia and sort of upper middle class, they would say, oh, you, do you live in El Alto? You're crazy. You'll be shot once you get off the bus. Of course, it wasn't like that at all, but that, that they had this idea that just the area that was just like 10 minutes away from where they lived in a car, they had an extremely stereotypical and, and, and yeah, um, negative view of, of, of this this area and the people who live there so i think we should it's, an, it's a good point we should be very careful of those identifications and categories thank you for flagging it it was a bit of a cheeky uh, cheeky video to put in in contrast to a uh, lecture on this module as well so i was curious Just, to see um, a quick note on the alternative we don't want to ignore them and uh, fall into this like you know i don't see color I don't, yeah. I don't see, you know, I don't see poor people. We're all just people. I think I should want to say something. If I want to say something. Um, yes, I, um, I have a, a comment about the challenges um, 
in uh, mapping. You are all um, a little bit in a different uh, in the in diff different research field, and I see this from the uh, yeah from the physicist perspective. And um, yeah, so if you say about mapping, I see only my research field, and this is remote sensing. So since three decades, remote sensing has been a very hot topic in the analysis of the urban environment. And in particular, hyperspectral, multispectral images from satellites, from airborne, uh, enable us to see more than uh, the colors in the visible light in the electromagnetic spectrum, or what the conventional cameras with red, green, and blue channel can capture. And behind that, Going to the infrared spectral range, we can see chemical and physical properties of materials. And if we can, if I, if I think about uh, changing areas, I see um, how, uh, how a city develops and I can actually see it very easy from, uh, from satellites. I can easily see it from, time from different time series and then see which area is stable. I can also see from the material perspective, for example, what kind of material of, the, of a roof is stable or is not stable. So, um, but there are also another solutions like laser to achieve not only images, but also three dimensional data. And um, yes, and uh, this is my point of view. Okay. Yeah. That was so useful. And it kind of goes back to Lucas's comment early on about understanding particular techniques and their possibilities rather than being quick to characterize. I'm aware that we've, uh, we've kind of uh, run out on time. And uh, unless somebody still has a burning question or comment, maybe we should uh, look to wrap up. Um, just to say, just to remind you, it would be really nice to have group for a writer comment to the discussion um, later today. And I noticed that group three is it's still pending to do it for yesterday. So make sure you do it while it's still kind of fresh in your mind because there's such richness in this discussion. And um, we can send out a, a question about this later, but if you wouldn't mind, it would be great to include uh, each group's daily reflection on the blog as well for people who might want to visit it. Um, if, if anybody objects, then we won't. And also we'd like to include your names so that it's clear that it was coming from your group with each day. But, uh, but Devin will send out a, you know, a question about that in the update today. And if you, if anybody minds just write the, and we respect that.